Tenekoto, no mai, haere mai. Hello everyone, welcome to the Walk in the Shadowlands podcast. Let me be your guide as we take a walk into the realms of the unexplained, of the paranormal, of things that go bump in the night and haunt your dreams. Your hosts... I'm Marianne. Thanks so much for joining me today, tonight, whatever time it is, wherever you're living in this beautiful world of ours. Sit back, relax, let me be your guide as we walk into the Shadowlands together and see what awaits us there. Hello everyone and welcome back. I'm so very excited to share this particular episode with you in my podcast and in my Facebook group. I have never made any secret of the fact that I have had ET or star people encounters my entire life. I've shared in this podcast and in others where I've been interviewed snippets of my experiences here and there. I've never been shy about talking about what I've been a part of, along with countless others throughout the world. So UFOs, encounters and abductions have always been a passion of mine. It's been a part of my knowing since I was a child, and part of the reason that I started this podcast to begin with, to help share information and knowledge about life that exists outside of this reality that we are all currently aware of and knowing about. So I do keep an eye out on what is, and more importantly isn't, being put out into all forms of media about this subject and all associated areas. So when I first heard of the new documentary movie released by the director James Fox and heard so many good comments about it, I simply had to watch it for myself, to see for myself if it lived up to its hype. Well, I have to say... And it's not often that I do say this about documentaries like this. That this one exceeded my expectations. I was so impressed with it and with the point that James simply presents the facts and lets you, the viewer, make up their own minds, although the evidence is pretty clear to see for those with open eyes and open minds. So, taking a huge leap of faith, I worked very hard to find contact details for James and sent him an email asking if he would be interested in talking with us all about this movie and what brought it about. Also, whatever else that he might want to share. To be honest, I didn't expect a response. After all, who am I in the grand scheme of things? Merely a small podcaster. This episode is the end result of that email. And so, as always, the question is... Are you willing to walk with me into this part of the Shadowlands and see what awaits us there? Then let's begin. My guest is fairly well known throughout the world, especially in UFO circles. English born but raised in the USA, James began his career as a documentary filmmaker in his 20s after travelling the world assisting his father who was a respected journalist. He has already created a number of UFO related movies that he is well known for. Starting in 1997 with the documentary UFOs 50 Years of Denial, followed in 2003 with the documentary movie Out of the Blue. Then in 2009, with the TV movie documentary, I Know What I Saw, and with a re-released and updated version of it called I Know What I Saw Director's Cut in 2014. Finally, this year, with the release of his tremendously successful and popular The Phenomenon. Since its release in October 2020, It has remained number one in the top rankings for documentary movies, a testament to the fact that people are wanting to know the truth, wanting to know that we are not alone in the universe 
and this movie certainly fulfills that need, in my opinion. Before I start this conversation with my wonderful guest James Fox, I'm going to begin with a quote from Christopher Mellon. Christopher Mellon was the former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defence for Intelligence in the Clinton and George W. Bush administrations and later for Security and Information Operations. He formerly served as the Staff Director of the United States Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, so this is a man in the know. Listen carefully to his words. Everything that we know and have learned about mankind and its place in the universe suggests that we are a part of the norm. We are not the exception. so very much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me on the show. Perhaps we could start with you telling us about how you got into documentary filmmaking and specifically how you got into the area of UFO documentaries. That would take us back to the early 1990s where I had a father who was paralyzed from the neck down with multiple sclerosis and he was a writer. And oh, wow. um, so I've been traveling. Oh, he was a fantastic, hilarious, driven, ambitious, intelligent, witty, great, fun guy. We traveled the world together. I was his legs, his chauffeur, oh. his secretary, his nurse. We just had a lot of fun. We interviewed Stephen Hawking. We interviewed uh, race car legend, Dan Gurney. Uh, we traveled to Formula One, races down in Mexico City. I mean, we did some really cool stuff. And uh, my, my father was a brilliant writer. I was always in, amazed at how he could put words together and um, so good at it. God, such a skill. And I had picked up probably in the late 80s, very early 90s, certainly the late 80s, early 90s, a video camera from a friend of mine. And uh, I was so... Uh, amazed at the technology of just the instant, you know, the did these it was tape back then, but the video, they, right. you know, instant playback. It's like, you know, it was amazing. It was a real novelty back then. And, and what a great tool it was for uh, you know, documenting things. And so I started doing uh, video production, you know, probably in my very early twenties. And, um, Probably, I don't know, I'm going to say when I was around 23, 24, a very good high school friend of mine, one of my best friends, one of my best mates, we uh, we bought a car in London. We flew to Europe from America and we bought a car in London and we drove this old Fiat 131. We, oh, wow. we painted the doors red, you know, it, we had like 200 pounds for it. We drove it all the way to Portugal 
had a just wow. you know just had a hell of a, an adventure together and and um the car didn't make it out of portugal we had to take, take a bus <laughs> back but uh he, he was a good friend of mine this guy renee and it, he started to tell me back back in the u.s um about ufos and he was one of my best friends honestly and um uh i had he didn't talk to me about it in high school but he talked to me about it later in our early 20s and i I thought he'd lost his mind. I, I really did. And he oh, was wow. talking about Roswell in particular. Oh, you haven't heard about Roswell, you know? And I just thought, well, it's, it's, he's been a good friend and I'm gonna have to write him off and he's lost his mind. And um, I was telling the story to a, a mentor of mine. This, I was apprenticing at a video production house in San Francisco, uh, Ellison Horn Productions, something like this. And this guy, Richard Van Sickle was, was you know, one of, the senior people at the production house, the brilliant guy. I really looked up to him and I just one day told him, Oh, you're not going to believe it. A really good friend of mine was telling me about UFOs and then about how a UFO crashed and aliens were recovered and in Roswell back in the forties. I was like, God, my poor friend, he's lost his mind. And uh, Richard turns to me and he says, Oh no, you haven't heard about that. I said, maybe I haven't heard about it. No, I haven't heard about it. He goes, Oh yeah, that fully happened. He said they actually admitted that it happened. And, and uh, I thought, well, hang on a minute. Like, you know, Richard is somebody I look up to and I respect and he's very intelligent and he runs this video production company. And, and I thought, well, if Richard thinks it happened, maybe I should take a closer look. And so I did. And um, I went to a couple of conferences and I uh, befriended some military guys, basically exchanged, offered an exchange of, of documenting them and making, uh, you know, uh, making their interviews available to the public and documenting presentations and things of that nature. And in exchange, they kind of brought me into their world a bit. And then um, I think when I was 24, maybe 25, I said, Hey, I'm going to do a documentary on UFOs. And I was amazed at how not unsupportive my father was because my father was incredibly supportive. Of everything I've done. He was the guy that would say, son, you know, if you ever want to do uh, whatever it is in life, as long as you're happy, if you want to be a garbage man or a teacher or, you know, I just, as long as you're happy, that's all that matters in life. And, and he was that guy. And yet he was uh, so opposed to me doing a documentary on UFOs. I mean, he was begging me not to do it. He used things like uh, you're going down a one way street. It's dead end. There's nothing to it. It's a waste of your life. Um, and he even had, other members of the family, which actually lived in Australia and England and France and Italy, uh, and even Singapore, writing letters and telling me to reconsider. Oh, wow. And your father was very concerned and this kind of thing. Wow. Um, and of course, being a Taurus, I, I thought, well, you know, I'll prove these guys wrong. And I think it was actually just what I needed because right. uh, I didn't realize how difficult it was to, you know, to shoot a documentary and, and edit and write. And that's a lot of work. I mean, a lot of it took me four and a half years, but I did it and I sold it to Discovery Channel. And, uh, you know, it was moderately successful. I mean, for the time it was, yeah, it was beautifully received. I, I eventually got invited to go to Russia because of it. Wow. And um, um, I sort of got the last laugh, really, you know, and I, people sort of stood back and thought, well, hmm, hang on a second. I, did, I wouldn't say I had the full attention of the family, but they were okay, wow. And uh, I said, well, that's the last UFO doc I ever do. You know, that was hell, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> and um, since then, I've learned never to say never. Never to say, you know, that that's it. Because I'm on my, I just finished my fourth and a half film on the topic. So <laughs> all 27 years later. Oh, that's funny. Why do you... Yeah, never say never. That's absolutely uh, a true say because something always comes up, doesn't it? Oh, my gosh, yes. You know, and that's the thing. It's like I got invited to Russia, and it was funny, actually, because it's something I don't really share that often, but I, I was – and if I'm rambling, just cut me off. But I um, – It's okay. I, I was selling – copies it was when art bell was doing was in the peak of art bell's show right ah the king yes and we we got featured a little bit on art bell um and we were selling 
which would have been VHS tapes, I'm assuming. I don't think the DVDs were popular back then. I'm, get, I'm gonna say VHS tapes. And I was selling VHS tapes of the film as well. I maintained home video, dist home video distribution rights. So I could right. do that on my own and make extra money from the Discovery Channel sale, which I was doing. And, and I got a letter back from a gentleman uh, who uh, very kindly said, hey, I, I, I bought one of your, your tapes and it arrived at my house broken. His name was Joe Bellotti. And, I, and he said, uh, could, would you mind terribly uh, sending me another one? And, um, and I said, of course, I, I wrote him a letter and I thanked him so much for his support. And I said, um, here's your money back for the inconvenience. Here's your postage back. Uh, here's two tapes, one for you. And please feel free to pass another one on to a friend of yours. Oh, and, wow. um, and uh, you know, thank you. And that was it. And, and about three weeks later, I kid you not, I never met this guy. He sent me a check for $20,000. And he said, I like the way you operate. I like what you're doing. I'm a wealthy man and I don't stop. And uh, yeah, then I got invited to Russia and that was, you know, that paid my way to Russia. And, and then I started shooting generals and they thought I was Fox from Fox News. And so <laughs> I had all this, I like military escorts. I kid you, I'm not kidding you. If you ever watch out of the blue, you'll see some of it in there. And um, I, when I got home from Russia, I said, well, I guess I'm doing another film on the topic. I didn't mean to, but I, how could I not? All these opportunities are presenting themselves. And, and that was the birth of Out of the Blue. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. There's a saying that I really, really like, and that's what comes from the heart touches the heart. And obviously the fact that you went out of your way to send him not one, but two, and, and refund him his money was, you know, that obviously touched him deeply. Yeah, well, I, you know, I treated him just like I would want anyone else. I mean, I, yeah. it, you know, my girlfriend at the time, it was really funny. I'll never forget it. She was like, you know, you can't afford to be giving stuff away and blah, 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 blah. And I said, just stop, you know, just please just stop. This is how I operate. And this is, you know, and so when that check arrived, I kind of like, you know, looked at her. And <laughs> I think she realized, like, <laughs> you know, yeah. but things like that happen and there are really great people in the world that have made this this effort possible and I you know Jesus I mean there were times on many occasions where I was so broke I couldn't barely afford to pay attention and uh, you just have to keep keep pushing forward you know right right I've never heard that saying before couldn't afford to pay attention oh uh, that's really funny can I go back to your dad for a second just to follow on why do you feel that he was so not key, not supportive about you doing UFO videos? You know, there was a campaign that started in the 50s. Mm. In fact, it was mm. 1953, mm. the Robertson panel 53. of, of yeah. ridicule, right? Yeah. And that was a very effective campaign to discredit and, uh, uh, yeah, discredit and ridicule the topic. And it was a yeah. very effective campaign. And very and my dad was a mainstream journalist, so he was like, you know, this is nonsense, uh -huh. and uh, he just he never looked into it. I mean, most people that quickly dismiss UFOs, myself included. I mean, I'm guilty of it as as well. Um, it's embedded in our psyche, you know, and mm. and, it, and it was an intentional thing that was done, mm -hmm. uh, very effective campaign, and um, mm -hmm. and it stuck. And so mm. anybody, you know, it's it's like knee jerk, you know, UFOs. Uh, crackpot, you know, new UFOs. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I remember <laughs> I, I dated this girl, Rachel, back in college, and um, I was 18 and she was 19. And she's she said to me, Oh, my my um, my previous boyfriend was was really into UFOs, and I just ugh. I was like, ugh, what, what? You're like, what? <laughs> Jeez. I didn't ask another question. I was like, ugh, what an idiot. Why would you do that guy? You know, <laughs> but isn't that funny? I mean, it was it was I, I was totally, um, you know, that programming or whatever it is uh, mm -hmm. affected me too. Social manipulation at its finest. That's yes. a classic example. Yeah. Did you find that you had, when you, when you started to make the phenomenon, did you find that you had 
um, resistance from any area getting it made? Like, what were the major hurdles that you had to overcome to make it? Uh, it was a nearly eight-year push. And uh, I only recently, in the last couple of weeks, have been able to kind of breathe and and reflect on the journey and wow. and um, and uh, how difficult it was. Um, I've shared this with other, you know, people. Uh, I, I I have PTSD from from this film. Um, wow. And uh, yeah, it was really really intense. I mean, my God, there was there were some very dark trying times. Um. It's it's the, the best way I can describe it is that you know first of all anything you do that's worthy of anything is, is incredibly difficult and you have to right. remind yourself if it were easy it would have been done right you know, if it were easy it would have been done already and mm -hmm. um and i'm pretty energetic and and enthusiastic and and uh you know stay stay positive and nose to the grindstone I, I i like to enjoy myself and have fun but i also work very very hard yes and uh and this 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 project when you say some of the hurdles i mean Jesus, where do you begin? I mean, there was it was a hurdle every single day. Uh, Some of them seemed insurmountable. Um, there were times when you know people tried to shut me down, mm -hmm. out of maybe just jealousy. I don't know. Um, I had to go through many different funding. Ran out of money a number of times. Um, I became a dad uh, at a time when things weren't going particularly well with the film and, uh, funds had dried up and I had to switch partners and find new producers and new, uh, new financial backing. And, and uh -huh. it's incredibly challenging. And look, these things happen and mm -hmm. especially with an independent production mm -hmm. and, um, you, you just have to keep pushing and, and you just don't take no for an answer. And, and you've got to, I hate to say it, kind of, you know, kind of sell your vision and you'd think it would be, you know, much easier considering it was my, you know, fourth and a half uh, attempt or yeah. project. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you're on easy street at all. I mean, you know, you, Great. you know, you get flavor of the week and then you're, you know, doesn't matter what you produced in the past. Yeah, so exactly. It, you know, yeah. The challenges were every possible, <laughs> every possible challenge, just even getting interviews at times, even when there were times when we had money, it was hard because, trying to secure interviews. People are quirky, you know, some people, the whole thing was hard. And then you get to the end and you're exhausted and you're, you know, you've asked, you've underestimated the, the, the budget and new things come out and you're trying to keep the, the, the project current. And at some point you have to say, look, this thing is done. Like we're done here, you know? Yeah. And, and uh, it, usually that happens once you're out of money you know, but you can also just be out of juice. You just, yeah. you know, you just don't have any more to push. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, you, you gotta, that last 10% is critical because we had a version that was about uh, two hours and 20 minutes, maybe something like this. Mm -hmm. And some people are like, oh, it's awesome. And I knew inside, no, it's not awesome. It, this thing needs to be trimmed, right, trimmed right down. And, um, that's a pretty brutal process, but you've got to keep yeah. pushing. Those end months are critical on, on a film success and, and uh, make sure the, the audio is done properly, all the color corrections done properly. Um, you know, uh, combing through every bit of narration and, 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 and weeding out anything that doesn't belong or anything mm -hmm. that's redundant. And it's, it's hard because you get connected to, to stuff. So yeah, but anyway, you just, you just got to keep pushing and, and you can't let up. You know, the, even when you're exhausted and you're on all fours and you're barely walking, you, you, that last push is, is very critical, very, very critical. It, the film wouldn't have been anywhere near as success, as successful as it is now had we gone out with, the, with this, even the second or third cut. Right. Um, yeah, so I hope and I answered that question. You, you did, and, and that's, I can understand because I actually, well, I was a nurse for most of my working life and then I had to leave it because of a work-related injury. So I retrained as a graphic designer and a computer, um, computer and website designer. And um, one of the things that, that they really pushed into us when I was training and happened so many times when you're creating a project, you really love what you've done. But you look at it and you have to throw the good cuts out, the bits you think are good out, but actually 
they don't need to be there. So I, I totally get what you were saying about having to throw bits of your, cut bits of your documentary out. It's hard. I, I remember one time in particular what it took to assemble this whole historical segment and what it went not just to get the, not just to obtain the content, you know, but, mm. but also putting it together and writing the narrative. I mean, it was months and months and months and months and months. We edited for three and a half years and, oh, wow. uh, and, it, and, it, and it had to go. And my, my, uh, one of my partners, this guy, Mark Barish, jokingly would say, James, it's time to kill your darlings, you know, and, and, and he had to do it and I had to do it. And, but there was one time in particular, I'll never forget it, where I highlighted it in the timeline and I highlighted the whole section. Now all I had to do was hit the delete button and it was poof, you know, and um, I had to close my eyes and, and almost hold my breath and just quickly hit the delete button because it was, it was like a gut punch, you know, um, but it was what was best for the film and nobody misses it. Right. Right. Uh, so hard, though, because you put so much of your heart and soul into it. Now, I, went to, I, I went to South America four times and not one second made it in. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, that's a lot of, that's a lot of time China, and a lot of effort. I went to China, China twice, all across China, and wow. maybe 30 seconds or a minute made it in at the do, end. Do you think with those bits that didn't make it, do you think you might stitch those together at some time for maybe a follow-on? <sighs> mm, probably probably yeah because I, I, yeah sorry sorry because yeah. it feels to me like so much love and energy and time went into it that it's such a shame to have it wasted when, yeah. You, yeah well i've got a lot of people telling me you know giving me advice right now uh, and i i need to sort of step back and think about what's best for the phenomenon great and and um and 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 uh you know i i i want to make the right decision and mm -hmm. and you know but i love the idea of having like a youtube channel which i used to have actually and just posting stuff for free on it you know the stuff that ended up on the on the edit room floor but that takes lots of management and it could deter it could take my focus away from Correct. bigger projects of, of that need to happen right now so yeah um, yeah i totally understand I, that i will tell but i am dedicated to the phenomenon and you know we're the flavor of the week right now oh yes which is, which is great but you know you have to capitalize and i don't mean that financially but capitalize on the on the spotlight right um, i feel like almost an obligation to keep the momentum going right and not letting up now because look how 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 much progress we've made in the last couple of years, right? Oh gosh, yes. Uh, one more, one more question on the area of making the movie before we oh, move please, on uh, is: Did you were you ever concerned about your personal safety and the safety of your family during the making of the documentary? There were times when, often actually, where I felt that. Um, you know, you just kind of feel like you're being watched. Mm -hmm. You know, you just kind of feel it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I felt that a lot. But I also felt secure knowing that I was working with people like uh, Senator Harry Reid. Right. And, and the New York Times and other, uh, other you know, governors and, um, and the like. I, I felt a little more protected in the sense that it was higher profile. Right. And I also had... Um, uh, one of my financial backers had, uh, um, you know, uh, assured me that that uh, we were, you know, we were we were being uh, looked after. Put it that way. That's so, right. Yeah. Yeah. I but look, I I didn't I didn't feel like my life was in danger. I never felt like that. But I did, you know, you feel like you're just you know you're poking around in places where you know. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. We we they don't want the sun to shine. Uh, people don't want the sun to shine. You're pulling yeah. the curtain back a little bit, you yeah. know. Yeah, some people want it, but there are other people that don't want it. And I actually got a call, funnily enough, which I'll share with you. I don't think I've told. I don't. I don't think I've told anybody. Maybe I have. Um, we got a call from a former CIA guy, and he said, uh, "Hey, I just want to let you know that your film is making the rounds at the Pentagon." 
And I said, wow. And he said, uh, yeah, so I'm a bracing for the impact. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He said, well, some people, you know, are happy about it, but some people are not happy about it because it's going to, you know, inform the public and uh, they're going to be, you know, uh, having to answer some questions. So that was kind of, that's kind of neat to know that, you know, that what we're doing is having a, is having an impact and, you know, it's, it's hard to, it's harder for the government. And I say the government, I don't know, I don't even know who they are at this point, but yeah. to, to, to give these ridiculous explanations of swamp gas and weather balloons <laughs> yes. to, an informed, to an informed public. Yeah, exactly. Correct. Correct. And that's actually part of the reason why I started my podcast, because I have been an experience in my entire life. So it, it was, I felt like it was important to let people know that, hey, hang on, we're not the only life form out there. There are others. And, you know, if they're, like like your government came out just this year and said, well, yes, these flying saucers are real, but we don't know where they're from. Yeah, I think that's probably true. Yeah. They've, yeah. Been, drip feeding, they've been drip feeding the public for about three years now. Mm-hmm. steadily so mm-hmm. your your documentary the phenomenon is time perfect timing perfect timing finally right finally yeah. it only took 27 years <laughs> you know i mean she's <laughs> yeah I, you know it, it's funny when i finished out of the blue i i remember it was really funny i remember my partner writing partner editing partner this guy boris zubov Great guy, love him to death. And he was in a fetal position, literally crying because I was pushing him so hard. He was having an emotional breakdown. And we all, it was pretty intense for all of us. But he was in a fetal position and he was just, oh, you know. And uh, his wife looked at me and she was livid. She's like, you're killing my husband. What's wrong with you? Stop it. Like, stop, you know, stop. <laughs> And I thought, okay, well, I guess the film's done at this point, you know. But in the back of my mind, I was like, the film's not done. <laughs> yeah. Well, we sold the film, and then three years later, I owned it again. We sold it to NBC Universal, broadcast on uh, Sci-Fi Channel. And um, and when I owned it again three years later, I I I I went back at it, and I spent another couple of years on the movie, tightening it up a bit, you know. Made it much better. It's, 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 it's called the director's cut. It's much, much, much better. But still, it wasn't there. Right. And then I had another go with, with I Know What I Saw. And uh, again, disappointed. Uh, good little film. I sold it for quite a pretty penny at the time for, to a and it, it went on History Channel. It's a two-hour special. Um, and that did moderately well. Yeah, we had some really high-profile public endorsements from, like, Steven Spielberg. And that was great. But still... Eh, I wasn't totally happy. It didn't, you know, when you have a concept in your mind of like what it is that you want to accomplish, you know, you think of it and then you, and then it materializes with all this hard work, Mm -hmm. the birthing, the birthing process. And, um, uh, with the phenomenon, I sat back and I'll never forget it. And, and, and I said, okay, I think we did it this time. I'm Mm -hmm. pretty happy. Wow. Isn't that nice? That's lovely when that comes. As an artist myself, I totally get what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. And it's not often that you feel like that, that you're actually no. satisfied. Because no. you, you look at your work and you go, mm, well, I should have done this or I shouldn't have used that color. Mm-hmm. Or, yeah, so I totally, totally understand that. So let's talk about your documentary itself and particularly Mellor. How did he get the data? You talk about Chris, Christopher Mellon? Yes, Mellon. Oh, did I say Mellon? Sorry, Mellon, yes. Yeah, no, no, no problem. Yeah, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Intelligence. He, um, you know, he didn't reveal exactly how it went about. What he said was, and he has to be careful, obviously, because it's kind of a big deal, is that they found a loophole, okay? Ah. Found a loophole and basically walked that evidence right out of the Pentagon and then mm-hmm. ended up on the front page of the New York Times. So, right. that you know, um, yeah, he's 
he said it was like a meeting in the in the parking lot with a briefcase, you know, and the and the and the tapes, something like this. But 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 there was a loophole. They, they didn't like uh, they didn't break the law. They bent the rules. Right. Right. Oh, very good. So yeah. for, for those listeners who are wondering what we're talking about, this gentleman was the gentleman who released the documentaries, uh, the the film footage, like the Tic Tac video. That's correct, isn't it? Yep. That's, that was uh, Christopher Mellon, yes. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. So that's how the, that footage got out into the public and the other ones as well. All three of them, was it from him? The tic Yeah, there were three involved. videos. Yeah, they were. But there's a lot more mm. we mm. know about, a, a ton more that have not been released. Oh. There's a, lot, there's a huge effort to, to, you know, get that stuff. I mean, look, we're pushing for government transparency, right? Right. And, you know, um, one of the bombshell moments of the film is when Senator Harry Reid, who's a household name in America, he was Senate Majority Leader. Everybody knows Senator Harry Reid, you know, and whether people agree with his politics or not, they're like, that's Senator Harry Reid. He's big time. You know what I mean? Right. And, and Harry, Senator Reid got Obama to run for president. I mean, that's like well known. Oh, and, wow. And, uh, you know, Senator Reid said that, there, that in the movie, I couldn't believe when he said it, that, uh, uh, most of the evidence hasn't seen the light of day. Uh, and that was, that was a moment. That's that definitely was, a bombshell. Definitely a bombshell. Definitely, definitely a bombshell, yeah. I know. So does that go along with um, the, the COVID-19 bill with the 180-day countdown for UFO disclosure that's doing rounds that at all, the moment? Yeah, that happened today. Or is it? Yesterday. Oh. Sorry, um, I got notified this morning about that story coming out. Uh-huh. And I'd known, I'd known about it. I'd heard about it through Christopher Mellon, but uh, I didn't quite totally grasp the concept of it. But evidently, it's, you know, it's like, it's like signed into law, basically. They have yeah. to this assessment of, of, of these things and make it public. So that we'll see. Yeah, well, sorry, we'll see. That's going to be very interesting to keep an eye out on that one. That is for sure. I think 2021 is going to be a very exciting year in general. Uh, I think it's going to be a very, very interesting year. So of all the experiences that you covered in your documentary, what, uh, which of all the experiences that you covered in your documentary do you feel to you were the most impressive? Um. I would have to say, if I could mention, could I mention four? Yes, please. Mention as many as you like. Yeah, I I really like, and funny enough, not that many people mention it. I think by the time they get to the end, they'd forgotten about this. But there was a very uh, dramatic encounter with Air Force Colonel uh, William Coleman, and it took place in 1955 yeah, yes, right. in a B-25 bomber over Alabama, and he was with a couple of uh, engineers from Lockheed and Boeing. And um, he, the significance of it is this: he, first of all, it's an incredibly dramatic, up close encounter, duration nine minutes, wow. that started at elevation 9,000 feet, the chasing a flying saucer in broad daylight and it ends up at treetop level where they literally thought they were going to collide with this disc in a wow. B-25 bomber at treetop level. And he said he had to take evasive action to avoid hitting it. And he said that if he would have turned the plane to the right, it was so low that the wings would have hit the trees. So he had to lift up first and then turn, wow. lost sight of it for a second. And then when they found it again, it was drifting across a field a recently plowed field and swirls of dirt on either end of the, of the disc were- Oh, that's right. Of course, I said it doesn't have a tail, doesn't have any wings. Look at the shadow on the ground. The shadow is perfectly round. That's not an airplane. And I 
said, I'm overtaking it. So I said, hang on. So I'm going to make a hard turn. There it was, a disc going across the field with two big swirls. And um, what makes it significant, A, it's a really dramatic encounter, qualified observers. Then he was later put in charge of, a, a public spokesman for Project Blue Book, which is the Air Force's investigatory arm of UFOs. Well, what's the first thing he did? Right. He talks about this, is uh, he went to find his own sighting. And guess what? It wasn't the... It wasn't there. <laughs> you know, the, 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 the more credible the sighting, the more credible the observer, the, the witness, the less likely it was to see the light of day. I was going to talk about, bring that up later, about the Cross Memo and Project Stark. Oh, yes, isn't that cool? Yeah. That, that was all Jacques Vallée, yeah. Anyway, the second one was probably the first uh, extremely well-documented close encounter of the third kind in U.S. history, uh, certainly modern history, and that is uh, Socorro, New Mexico, 1964, with the police officer Lonnie Zamora. Right. That case is, is really compelling. I saw this uh, big cloud of smoke, so I decided to let go of the car and go up there and investigate. By the time I got there, I could see a big white object sitting in the arroyo. I couldn't tell what it was at first. You know, I loved hearing from the police officer's wife for the first time, the impact it had on his life. Yeah. Uh, you know, all the government records, the Air Force records from Project Blue Book, all the, even documented, the doing diagrams, the landing site and the footprints of the creatures and just, just such a compelling case. Um, uh, then, you know, the um, hearing from Al Chop, who was in the radar room, mm -hmm. the night of the, there were two consecutive flyovers of Washington, D.C., the Capitol building, the White House, right. um, and hearing from, and I'd heard about that case for a long time. In fact, I've covered it in previous films, but hearing someone who was actually in the radar room that night, Al Chop, testimony, that archival footage of that interview with, uh, was taken by a guy named uh, Tom Tullian of Project Archive, or Project Sign Archive uh, of Al Chop is just, you know, listening to him describe the, pilot who's flying at 600 miles an hour in the pitch black over the Capitol and suddenly finding himself surrounded by unknowns mm. and getting on his radio and radioing down to the tower and basically saying, and look, the people in the tower were listening to his voice, Al Chop included, and, you know, and seeing on the radar dish that they're all around him. Mm -hmm. and hearing him say, I'm surrounded. What do I do? You know, and they all didn't know what to tell him. He actually said they're closing in on me. What do I do? It was frightening. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and hearing that, something about hearing that first-hand testimony of someone who was in the radar room, really brought that case to life for me. Mm -hmm. uh, fascinating case. And then, of course, um, uh, Rue in Zimbabwe, 1994. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the landing at the school. Um, hearing from the, the, you know, the children, uh, thanks to Dr. John Mack, the Harvard psychiatrist, who interviewed the children in Africa right after it happened. 66, they think there were only 66 people in the playground, but no, there were 100 people in the playground, 100 children. Mm -hmm. 66 of them went on camera. So uh, as I went to Africa and I went to the school and I talked to the teachers and there was, there was about a hundred kids in the playground and it was 1030 in the morning, broad daylight and just the sheer volume of eyewitness testimony. And then of course, tracking the, the children down yeah. 20 years later and bringing them in as, a, as young adults and listening to their, their stories now after they've had time to think about it and articulate, you know, uh, it's just, it's a really compelling case. That um, flew past really slowly. I saw the bigger one and the spaceship, like four or five of them. It was red, green and yellow. There was this big ship. It had these lights, these patterns, and it flew. Yeah, that one really, I've always followed that one and the West for one in Aussie. And there's been did a couple know, of other school ones. Did you know about the Westall UFO case? Because I didn't. 
It was vertical, horizontal, move away from us, back towards us, appear somewhere else? No, no, I didn't. Uh, they, I, I'm absolutely amazed. These, these, both these cases got very little publicity, very little. In fact, they were so not very well known at all. So the fact that you included them, to me, they're probably some of the most credible cases ever because they were seen by modern, and, and certainly with the Zimbabwe one, they, they were actually, it actually landed and they were being seen. Yep, yep, I know, right? Yeah. He had a big head and big black eyes and was dressed in a black bodysuit. How far away were you when you saw him? Uh, not very far, not very far, about a meter away. A meter away, that close? Yes. I stand by what I saw. There was no reason for any of us to make that up. Crazy, I know. It's just amazing. And look, even that one little with Father Gill that took place at uh, Papua New Guinea in 19, 1950, was that seven, 58? But that's an incredible, that was really fascinating to hear, you know, Father Gill. I mean, I'd heard about that. It was 1958. I can't even pronounce it correctly. You, but you're the one that's going to pronounce it properly. Pa Papua New Guinea. Papua. How do you say that? Papua. Papua. Thank you. Papua, Papua New, New Guinea. Guinea. I probably Thank mispronounced you. it as well. Um, but but here, you know, that was what it took to track down that interview with with Father Gill. This solid-looking object, and can you imagine what it's like to look up in the sky and see some figures up there? Oh my gosh, I, I could write a doc. You, you could do a documentary on, on every single archival bit of footage that we found. Yeah, really. <laughs> I, 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 to uncover. As I was watching your documentary, I was thinking, oh my God, he's gone to such effort to track these people down, to find them, to connect them, to get them to actually talk. That, that really impressed me greatly because I, I recognized how much actual work was involved for you so insane it, it absolutely insane and i try not to read the reviews of you know because they say don't just don't do it because people are just so you know yeah and uh and i see some you know probably some quasi seasoned you know ufo enthusiasts uh you know oh there's nothing new in this documentary same old rehashed you know just whatever and i think to myself what are you talking about like I can tell you that some of the most seasoned historians have gone, where did you find that interview? Where did yeah. you find those headlines? Where did you find those audio bits? I'm like, thank you for recognizing that. That was a monumental effort yes. that took years. Yeah. The 1978 footage at the United Nations, the very man, Lee Spiegel, who put that event on with Jacques Vallée and, and Dr. Jalen Hynek, he didn't even have that footage. and didn't even think it existed. And wow. we found it. Wow. You know? And, yeah. and then all these other archive interviews. So, and I can't change history. If we're going to cover some of the history, some of the more salient aspects of, of UFO history, um, it is what it is. But, yeah. you know, having new testimony and new archival, never before seen footage uh, really brings it to life in a way that I haven't seen it done before. It really does. And I, I was actually reading some, when I was researching this, I was actually reading some of the, bits that people had written and I saw that someone said oh it's nothing new and I'm going what did these yeah. people watch this with their eyes closed and and I'm quite I watch these documentaries with a with a knowing eye because I know what I know right, um, right. you know from personal experience so I look at these documentaries and I and I look at what they produce and I'm going but with yours, it was stuff that hadn't been out in the public. It, you know, I, I think these people, they just, some of them, they just look for things to... Criticise. Criticise, yeah, because that's, that's what they feel their job is. You know, but, but I do think, like, if you knew the lengths that yes, I went yes. to uncover never-before-seen archival footage or extremely rare archival footage and what we did, it was a... Monu Herculean effort. I cannot emphasize that enough. What it took years. Oh, I absolutely recognize that. And as soon as, as I was watching your documentary, that was what really hit me was the fact that the efforts you had 
gone to because I knew what a task it was to track these people down and to get people to talk. It, you know, that really impressed me uh, as much as anything. So overall, James, how well do you think that the public's received your documentary? Obviously really well because it's doing it's good. Been, it's but. been number one on iTunes worldwide for documentaries and just stuck at number one. It just doesn't move. In fact, I, it's I, great. Can, look, I can look right now and see if it's still there. It's, it, it kind of blows my mind, quite honestly. Um, wow. My partner, Rebecca, she's like, Honey, your phone is broken. You need to try it on my phone. It's, that's not right. And then I said, <laughs> yeah, there it is. Stuck right there. Number one. Wow. Stuck there. That's awesome, James. Yeah. And that's so it's well It's unbelievable. It's just day after day, week after week, it doesn't budge. It has not moved from number one. You, that's because... You know, what comes from the heart touches the heart. And when you speak a truth, when you tell a truth, people resonate with it and they're so level. And people now, more people than ever, are waking yes. up to the fact that there are many more realities than the one we're currently knowing of. But I, I would like to talk about Jacques Vallée and the Ford Meadow. Yes. And um, when you brought up Project Bluebeam, which was really just a cover project to placate the um, masses, which really was nothing, but po Project Stark was a well thought out, well funded, highly technical underground project. So, can you tell us, uh, uh, my listeners, about that, please? Well, yeah, I mean, it just it's it's proof positive that paralleling this dog and pony show of Project Blue Book. Um, which was, you know, poorly funded. And only, I think it only had a staff of maybe three or four at the most. Uh, just, you know, um, and uh, was a incredibly well-funded underground, super secret, off the radar uh, UFO project where they were utilizing sensors and had budgets and scientists and all that. And, and Dr. Uh, Dr. Valet came across this memo, which was actually classified top or, or secret um, in Heineck's own files. And um, eventually through a, a quite a tedious uh, process, had it declassified and, and made it available to us. And he's like, look, you know, there's a lot of documents out there, but this is bona fide. Like I myself found it. I myself got it de you know, uh, de 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 declassified and, and, um, you know, wasn't redacted and, it's, you know, Valet puts a lot of weight on that. I, he found mm -hmm. it. I mean, it's a legitimate government document. It's not. You know, yeah. So that's what makes it exciting. I mean, that, does it really surprise me? It doesn't really surprise me. Does it surprise you? Of course. You know, no. You know, you've got unknowns penetrating sensitive airspace, whizzing around with impunity. Of course, they're going to put all hands on deck and try to get to the bottom of it and, and allocate serious, significant resources to, to figure out what's going on. Right. I mean, it's their job. Of course they have to do that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I found that it really interesting. Um, and that's, that's new. That's never been in the public before. No, no, no. I mean, that's, that's, that was the first time that I'm aware of that he ever went, uh, gave an interview about it and shared it and all the details and, yeah. Jacques, yeah. Jacques had a couple of uh, little tricks that he pulled out of his sleeve during production. Um, and uh, I actually consider Jacques a dear friend now. I have so much respect for him. Uh, so much respect for him. I mean, I just, you know. Um, yeah, so much respect for that man. I mean, I, all I can do is just listen and learn, really. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he, he's a very interesting chap. And, of course, they used him in the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Spielberg, Isn't that crazy? Spielberg used I know. him. I know. It's crazy. Yeah. I, wonder if, you know, really, I, wonder, really. I wonder if Steven Spielberg has seen this movie. He saw my last UFO film. I don't know if he's seen this one or not. I would imagine. I mean, how could he not have? I don't know. Well, I, I would imagine that he probably has. I'm surprised you haven't heard from no, him. No, I know. I'm surprised, too. I'm, I need to follow up on that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so 
What are your thoughts about the government response today compared to 1953 when they, you know, ridiculed and how do you feel about the government handling, well, not only the government, but the press no longer ridicules these subjects when they come up on the television? I think the climate has changed significantly, particularly since Mm. the front page of the New York Times featured that uh, previously secret UFO uh, Pentagon program, mm. ATF. Right. Oh, yes. Yes, that's Space right. Aerospace Threat Identification Program. I think that everything changed on that day. And I knew it at the time because uh, I've had skeptical family members and you know friends over, over the decades. And, and when that hit, even my neighbor was a famous editor. He, he edited a, Apocalypse Now. His name was Oh wow! And Walter even said, "My God, you know, James, like, you, you know, you it looks like you were right <laughs> all these years, you know." And uh, that's 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 been that's been uh, it's nice to see. And I, like I said, the climate has changed. Is being yeah. taken seriously. It's being acknowledged as something. And uh, I think that twenty twenty one is going to be an exciting year for all of us. It's. It's going to be a very exciting year. And, of course, with the COVID situation, people have had time to sit and think about things. They've had time to look at the sky and and see what's out there, you know, whereas before they wouldn't have had that space to do that because they're just so busy uh, living their lives. Yeah. You know, people are busy. I, you know, it might be actually the perfect time. I mean, you know, people are stuck in their homes. Everything's kind of changed, you know. It, it, yeah, I mean, I, I think I you remember, I think it was in April, April or May, I can't remember, but, you know, basically the government said, Department of Defense, yes, those videos are legitimate and they're true unknowns. Basically admitting, mm-hmm. you, you know, for the first time that, you know, these things are real and they're probably the world <laughs> week. And I remember some comments online on social media, people were going, this happened, this happened, and the government just said aliens exist. So there we go, you know. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and 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 what amazes me is that, that it didn't make worldwide no, news. Know. You know, there wasn't a big. You know, you know the best way I can describe that. I was interviewing a probably a group of about five or six women that were hospice workers. They described the massive UFO flyover of Phoenix, Arizona in 1997, oh, yes. March 13th. I don't like to call it the Phoenix Lights. It's commonly referred to as the Phoenix Lights because it was more than right. lights. It was a massive craft, m- multiple craft. Yeah. But anyway, I'm interviewing these women and they were describing how they're having tea. It was a late afternoon, early evening, summer. And um, all of a sudden, this object that looked like a floating city, according to their description, floated right over the top of them and it took a couple of minutes but they could see the craft and they said look if we hadn't looked up we wouldn't have even known it was there that's how quiet it was but it floated over the top of us and they could see compartments in the metal like like looked like they described it looking like a city and it just floated very slowly right over the top of them very low and like i said it took a couple of minutes and they all just sat there with their mouths open looking up at this thing and, uh, and then they went, and then it passed over. And then they went right back to chatting about what they were chatting about. And I said, well, hold on a second. Well, didn't somebody get up and run to grab a camera or get in your car, chase it like something? They said, no, we didn't. I said, well, how could you not? They said, I, I don't know. Yeah. But I think that it's so massive, a concept. It's such a... Uh, People don't know how to process it. It's 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 beyond, mm-hmm. you know, something to, to wrap your mind around. And so they just, it's almost like it just didn't happen. It's like, you know, you can't process what just happened. So it's all, yeah, yeah. To treat it like a non-event. It's weird. It's it's really strange. It's it's really strange. And I've yeah. talked to a number of witnesses that have had things. Not all of them, but a lot of them that just they can't even process it. You know. Yeah. 
of, of course, because it's so far out of their normal paradigm. Oh. And and I forget what it's like for people because for me, UFOs and star people are, are just my day-to-day reality, you know. So I forget what it's like for the person who doesn't have those experiences. It's very overwhelming. And people have to really change their paradigms and change the way they think about things. And for some people, it's just too hard. You know, it's just that's too- a good case. And I, I remember talking to a number of, of, of witnesses on the Phoenix Lights case. And there was one car that I, I spoke to the drivers that, that pulled over on Interstate 10 between Tucson and Phoenix. And they said that, in fact, most of the cars on the freeway had pulled over and people gotten out and were looking at this massive boomerang shaped craft floating very slowly, uh, yeah. just down the freeway, right over the top of the freeway on its way. I think it was from Phoenix to Tucson or Tucson to Phoenix. I'm pretty sure it was Phoenix to Tucson. And um, and then they got back in their cars and off they went. Yeah, I know, crazy, eh? Crazy. They don't question well, it. Well, you know, yes, I mean, yes. I do, what do you do? I mean, you know. I, yeah. I, yeah. And of course, and of course, people are, are because of how it has been treated, people are well, were more shy back then about speaking out than they are now because of the ridicule. You know, I would love to see a mass sighting like the one of 1997 over Phoenix, over Arizona, sorry, started in mm. uh, the, the tip of, uh, the southern tip of uh, Nevada and then worked its way across the state of Arizona from north to south uh, over several hours. And uh, if something like that happened today, and it was witnessed by a lot of people at the time because it the hail bob comet was going on back then. People were out right. in the night sky to get a glimpse of the hail bob comet. But if it happened today, which inevitably it will, um, there would be a lot of cell phone footage of it. You know what I mean? Yes. So yes. I think that that's going to be yes. exciting. You know, and, and one thing I'll point out that's interesting. You know, you don't. People say, "Well, if UFOs are real, wouldn't they just land on the White House lawn?" Well, um, we don't know. Like, look, you look at what they do, but you look at what they don't do. They don't make themselves overtly known. They've done pretty outrageous mm-hmm. stuff for sure. But in terms of like just, you know, all they'd have to do is hover over the Macy's Day Parade uh, or New York City on New Year's Eve and it's a done deal, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. you know, but they don't do that. Um, yeah. And uh, you have to ask yourself why. You know, why is it mm-hmm. that they reveal themselves just enough but not too much? You know, and yeah. one can only speculate, but you know, you look at what they do, but you also look at what they don't do. That answers question. Yeah, it, it does. Exactly. So where do you think you're going to go from here, James? You're going to have a break, a well-earned rest? No. <laughs> <laughs> In a word? No. I knew you were going to say that. No, no. I thought I was going to, but, <laughs> but, um, I, I feel a, a sense of obligation to, um, to take advantage of the momentum that's, that's occurring right now and not, oh, and not let up as much as I'd like to. I think it would be a mistake. So, uh, yeah, so right. I'm going to keep the hammer down right now. Yeah, I, I totally get that. And, and you're right. You, you really need to take, take advantage of the momentum. You have to, right? the yeah, favor of the don't. week and uh you know next week it'll be somebody else and that's great you know and I, i'm yeah. i'm really happy that you know we 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 uh set the bar for how this topic really needs to be treated and reported. oh my gosh you certainly have right and i'm really proud yeah. of that i really am and it took a village yeah. i mean look i was just one of many people and, and i i say yeah. this sincerely it is that um the, this film's success is all of our success. Uh, this is not about me and any one person. This story is about all of us. And we all are entitled to know what's going on, whether it's a little frightening or not. And um, it, it's, it's part of our place in the universe and it's part of a much bigger uh, story. And, and I think we're all entitled to, um, to the information. I, I really do. I, I, I look at my son and I think I'd like for him to grow up in a world where 
this is not being kept secret. Yeah, I totally understand that. And that's very well said, James, very well said. And I absolutely agree with that. People have a right to they know. Do. It's our right. And a lot of the information has been held back because they, they use it to that people will panic, that religions will go under, that they won't have the control that they have currently over the humanity. As we, as we and stand. Don't, you, don't James, you think it would have a unifying effect on humanity? I say. I, I would think so. I do because I think mm -hmm. it like forces us to see ourselves for who we really are. I mean, look, exactly. I had the distinct privilege of getting a sit down interview with a six man who walked on the moon. Yeah. And I will never forget what he told me. Um, when I want to really absorb a particular story, I always close my eyes because I allow the words of the witness to, to recreate the story, the imagery in my mind, right? It's almost like right. I'm living, I'm experiencing it through their, through them, like through their eyes, mm. right? And I get them to give me vivid detail. Uh, and I close my eyes and then it recreates these visuals and it's amazing. And um, I listened to Dr. Edgar Mitchell, six man, Apollo 14, because uh, I asked him, and I said, I know that you get this all the time, and I'm super duper sorry to ask this of you, but my God, what was it like to land on the moon? So he told me in vivid detail, and he said, I'll never uh -huh. forget this. He said, I stood on the surface of the moon, and I watched an earth rise. And he said, there was this blue marble, this beautiful blue marble suspended in the vacuum of darkness. And he said, there were no borders, no country lines, no. And he said, I, I picked up one hand and I blocked out the entire earth with one hand and um, the palm of my hand and um, everything we knew. And he realized, you know, you see it, we're, we're one race, one people, one planet. And I think that this story uh -huh. coming out would, would have that unifying effect on, on all of us. I really believe that. What a beautiful description he gave. I could just, like you, I could yeah. just see that in my mind's eyes, you know. I guess that's the thing when you're a creative, artistic type person, it's easier to visualise yeah. stuff like yeah. that. And, yeah, that's really, really touching. And that's a really nice way to actually, I think, end our conversation. James, I'm so grateful for your time today. I've really, really enjoyed this conversation. You're video website is the phenomenon yeah. phenomenon the yeah, so, is that so here's the thing if your uh, your audience your listeners uh uh want to help out they can uh rate the film it's super duper helpful it really is incredibly helpful believe it or not because it goes on algorithms and the ratings and then other platforms mm -hmm. look at it oh this is rating well so to take the time if you like it and hey take the time even if you don't like it and you can rate it but rating the film is incredibly helpful it take only takes a minute you can just give it a star rating you can say something or you could just give it a star rating uh, that's very helpful um rotten tomatoes itunes amazon the other thing is if you want to rent it then just google and find the least expensive i think it's a couple dollars but if you want to buy it there are only two platforms that offer three hours of bonus material for free. No, ex no extra cost. Yeah, I put three hours of bonus material in. And then I found out that only iTunes and Vimeo offered the three hours of bonus material. So those are the only two platforms. If you buy it, that you should buy it from is iTunes or Vimeo. And you get three hours for the same price of bonus material. Dang, I missed that. Yeah, no, <laughs> I have to go and to get tell it. people that because, you know, people should know if they're going to spend the money and buy it, they, they should get the, the, the three hours of it, great hours too. Like, really, I put some good stuff in there. Oh, I'm going to have to go back and buy that, James, so I can see the extra bits because the, the movie itself is amazing. And I cannot stress enough to my listeners, look, go out and watch it for yourself. James has put his heart and soul into this and it shows. It's really an amazing, amazing movie. James, thank you for your time. I've truly appreciated this. It's been really interesting. Well, thank you for having me on. I've had a wonderful uh, time myself. Thank you for your support and, and all your enthusiasm. Thank you. Seriously.
I'd like to thank James for his time today and for the permission to use the sound clips from his documentary, The Phenomenon. I'm very grateful for both. I've thoroughly enjoyed my conversation with James and I hope you all have as well. Please share this episode with anyone you feel would listen to it. I'm going to close this conversation as I started it with another quote from Christopher Mellon. We need to begin to prepare to accept and understand that we are not alone in the universe, have not been at all throughout this time. If you enjoyed this podcast, as James said earlier in the episode about rating his movie, please do the same for our podcast. The ratings of this podcast are looked at by people, and if it's rating well, then they are more likely to want to listen to it. It really does help immensely. So give it a positive rating and a review. Thank you so much. Today's bumper music is called Galactic Battles by Bonnie Grace. Sort of appropriate, don't you think? I'm so very grateful to my patrons for their ongoing support. If you want to become a patron of the show, then head over to patreon.com forward slash mcc15 and sign up now. As a patron, you get access to a special members-only page on the podcast website www.walkingtheshadowlands.com from which you can download full transcripts of each episode. You also have access to some interview bits that may not make the episodes and little extras as I have time to create and add them for you. You also get early access to the shows before everyone else gets to hear them. Also, you have my absolute gratitude and appreciation. So, what are you waiting for? Go to patreon.com forward slash mcc15 and sign up now. The continued support of my patrons makes it possible for me to financially cover part of the cost of producing this show for you all, so thank you all so much. If you have any suggestions for topics you might like me to cover in upcoming episodes, then please don't hesitate to contact me. Or if any of you have any questions, suggestions or any comments that you would like to make or experiences that you might like to share with myself or my audience or... If you feel you might be a good fit as a guest on my podcast, then just email me at shadowlands at yahoo.com or check out the Be A Guest page on the podcast website. Check out our Facebook page, Walk in the Shadowlands, our Instagram feed of the same name, and our Twitter feed at Shadowlands10. Like and follow for hints on our upcoming episodes. And of course, so you don't miss out on any episode, make sure you subscribe on your favourite podcasting platform. This podcast is available on all free podcasting platforms and iHeartRadio as well. Also, if you have Alexa, simply say these four words, Open Walking the Shadowlands, and Alexa will play our latest episode for you. If you don't have a smartphone, then you can listen to the episodes from the podcast website, www.walkingtheshadowlands.com. For those hearing impaired, there's a full written transcript of each episode on the website, so you don't miss out at all. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell your workmates about our show. Encourage them to listen and to subscribe also. The more, the merrier. Thanks for listening to this episode. Kakite ano oya koi. I'll see you again. Thanks for listening. 